this is strange. I love being recorded. Um, so I guess the plan for today, um, sorry, I was just talking to my brother on the phone until like five minutes ago, so this is going to be, I might be a little spacey at the beginning, but I'll hit my stride, I'm sure. Uh, the plan, we're going to finish off section 5.3 uh, that Deanna started. Uh, unfortunately, most of it is just a lot of definitions. So I think you're not supposed to put more than one definition every 20 minutes. I think I'm going to aim for one definition per board. So we'll see how that goes. Um, ideally, we'll finish this stuff up. Like, it's just a bunch of definitions, but I think they kind of all interact, so we should understand how that works. And then uh, if there is time, hopefully there is time, I would like to prove something out of section 5.4 because it's a really cool proof that I stumbled across on Stack Exchange. Uh, I ran into Nick's office and I was like, oh, this is, this is awesome. This is awesome. I want to show you. So uh, hopefully we get to that. So uh, without further ado, let's start. So uh, this is kind of going to seem maybe disconnected. I don't, it's, I'm not sure that this directly follows from what Deanna was doing last time, but we're just going to just start with something. Uh, so one definition per board, right? So, OK. Definition. Um, we'll define. Uh, an A scheme, so for a ring A, um, which is the following. So say X I'm going to insist that all of the rings over my structure sheet, they're all A algebras, right? And of course, so are the restriction maps. Um, that's all compatible in a nice, happy way. Uh, maybe just in case people don't remember, I don't, I'm not sure what everyone's algebra background looks like, but um, for, for our purposes, by an A algebra, I really will just mean a ring B equipped with a ring homomorphism into B that doesn't need to be injective. Usually, usually when we think of algebras, they are, but I don't, don't really need that to happen. Um, basically, the point is that I can give B an A module structure by just multiplication by its image. Um, but I don't necessarily need that to be injective. So just in case that comes up, that, that is the definition that you see like in a TM McDonald or something like that, um, in case anybody panics suddenly. Um, Maybe recall also, um, if, if B is, is finite as an A module, we usually call the algebra finite. If it's finitely generated as an algebra, so that is to say it's in a, in a polynomial sense, so there's, uh, there's some elements, say, x1 through xn in B, and every element in B is a polynomial in those variables with coefficients taken out of A or, I guess, the image of A, uh, then we call it the algebra finitely generated, or we'll call it finite type. So uh, with that in mind, definition on the next board. Uh, maybe I'll give an example. So e.g., uh, Cx is a finite type C algebra, but it's not finite. Set of join root two is fine. Okay, so it's the next thing I want to define. Yeah. So suppose I have an A scheme. I want to come. I want to come up with some kind of analogous definition. Sorry, I'm talking to the board. Uh, how do I want to put this? Okay. Go like this. So the same way we've always kind of defined these things, if, if x can be covered by a whole bunch of open affines, say some spec bi's, Uh, 
Um, so if, if I can cover it, a bunch of open affines, each of the, the BIs is a finitely generated A algebra, then we'll call it locally a finite type. Um, the same way we would, I guess, for algebras. If also, if it's quasi-compact, we'll call it just finite type. So there's maybe a bunch of different ways that you can say this language. This is kind of, I'm sorry that I have to put you all through this. It's just going to be a bunch of terminology. But there's a bunch of different, I'm not going to write them all down, but there's a bunch of different ways you could call this, right? You could say, OK, it's a locally finite type A scheme. It's a scheme which is locally a finite type over A. It's any number of ways. But we all know what we mean by this, right? That's kind of the point. OK, good. Not too bad. Um, so remark. And squeeze in one more remark before our definition again. Yeah, it's and things like, and the right now you just basically explain you add this over a to it. Yeah, that's that's basically yeah, yeah. Because we had we had like no theory and condition was given this way, reduced condition was given this way. Uh, oh, any number of them were all given this way, I think. Yeah, so. Um, Basically, actually, what you're about to say. So, if I'm locally finite over an Euthyrian ring, then I'm actually locally in Euthyrian. So, K, Z, such things. Anybody guess why? Sorry, what's QC? Oh, quasi compact. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I think Dana started doing that, and I don't want to write, I want to write as little as possible because I'm already writing too much. Uh, anybody guess why? Anybody? Anybody is awake? <laughs> so um, if you're a finally generated algebra over an Euthyrian ring, you are Euthyrian. Yeah, so that's, that's Hilbert's basis theorem. All right. Um, we know that finally generated algebras look like, well, they look like polynomial rings, finite polynomial rings, modern ideal. All right. Hilbert's basis theorem tells you if, you're, if you have an Euthyrian ring, and the polynomial rings are theory and quotient are theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And our definition of local neo theorem is the same, just replaced with the theory everywhere. Um, and okay, if x is quasi compact, then no the theory. If I add in quasi compactness, then I get the full no theory hypothesis. Okay. So that's all good. So some examples. I promise I'll squeeze a definition on this side. Um, maybe I'll go like this. There's an example, finite type C scheme. Everybody agree? Maybe? Yeah? That should be okay? Certainly. KC? Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote. <laughs> sorry. All right, there we go. Now we're good. <laughs> now we all agree. <laughs> um, what else? So, I, I, I thought it was just some ideal in there? Okay. Yeah, any ideal you want. Any ideal? Yeah. Because okay. now we're. We're quasi compact, and we've got it covered by, or like the ring in question is finally generated over K. So, is also finite type C scheme. K scheme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I wrote C in my notes for some reason, because everything I do is over C. Um, maybe this one takes a little bit more work, so maybe we should see this. So, at some point, We did this. Uh, some combination of Nick and Brett, I think. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure who did this, to be honest. 
but we did do this. So we had a covering. We had a covering of projector space by spec of some things. Um, these were these were these were taken to be the basic open sets in some projective sense. So I, I won't write it quite that way because I wanted to illustrate this, but. Certainly, this is finally generated. Yeah. Uh, if I localize, I'm going to stay finally generated. Convince yourself. And actually, it's not true that a subring of a finally generated ring is finally generated. But there's a there's a fact. I think. Okay. Yeah. 4.5d. Because of the way that this is set up, when you look at the degree zero piece, I'm not sure if this was done. I think it was done. Maybe. If if not, there's the reference there. Um, the degree zero piece in this setup will stay finally generated. So now I've got, well, I've got it expressed as a finite cover, causing it back each of the guys is finally generated. Okay, so you're finite type. Okay, good, some examples. Surely I have a definition next. Yes, I do, two of them actually, good. Okay, so moving along with this sort of definition type stuff, uh, we'll want to define uh, affine varieties. Sorry, I keep moving in and out of the frame. Um, apparently, we're not going to define a variety until somewhat later. I think, I, if I remember right, I think it's section 10. So for now, we're just going to define an affine variety. Um, apparently, we need to exclude abominations, which kind of terrifies me, to be honest. So uh, like, I, maybe, maybe I'm not sure if, if you guys can say anything. I think you mentioned something like separatedness yeah. in Bubikin. Yeah. So we're, for yeah, for now I guess we we stick with affine varieties over fields. So, uh, but I'll give that definition now I guess. There's other ways that I can say this. I could say it's an affine K variety. I could say that's probably it, actually. Not all permutations of those letters are going to work. Yeah, OK. So anyways, if you have an affine scheme and it's reduced in finite type over K, then we'll call it an affine variety. OK. Uh, there's an analogous definition for projective things, quasi-projective things, which make sure I can get it right. Yep. I'll put quasi in brackets. Yep. Okay. So there's my definition in the quasi projective case. So you may ask, where's the, where's the finite type? Where did that go? Because it's here, but it's not here. Right? Well, it's because they're always finite type. Right? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to mention that. Maybe I'll put this as a note. Actually, I didn't catch this until the second time I went through. I thought, why? where did it go? Did I, did I miswrite it in my notes? Like, and then I, then I realized that, of course, no, no, it's always true. So you always get finite type out of this. So um, maybe if, if we don't remember, so quasi-projective scheme is just a quasi-compact open subscheme of projective one. So um, you can convince yourself if you take an open subscheme, the same basically argument will work, and that you'll still be at least locally finite type. So you can cover it by a bunch of specs of things, all of which are finitely generated if I take an open subscheme. Right? The, you know, I just make the set smaller. Every section had to be. A, so should be fine. Um, and because the definition of quasi-projective scheme includes quasi-compact, I get finite type. Right. Um, so don't panic. It's there. OK, so I'm still averaging out OK. One, two. 
I don't know if you guys are counting. Is this a board or is like is this two boards? I don't know. We'll see how I do. Um, should be a case yes. Sorry. Good eye. Good eye. Okay. Okay. So. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Sorry. Yeah. Because we've only. Sorry. Yes. You're right. Of course. Because we've only we've only said like what does it mean to be finite type over k. Yes. It needs to be a case scheme to do that. Yeah. So, um, I guess I think even Vakil says something like this is really cumbersome notation, but too bad, <laughs> something like that. So, uh, sorry that I get to be the one to do this to you all, but um, you all just have to bear with it. Uh, exercise. Let's see. what this definition says. I need to start with an affine scheme over k. It needs to be a finitely generated k algebra. It needs to be a spec of something. So they all basically have to look like this. So the question is, okay, when, when do I actually get a k variety? So the only real check, the, the only thing that basically I'm going to need to have a look at here is this reduced condition. So this is a very reasonable thing to ask for. So this completely characterizes them. Second, okay, what happens in, in the projective case? Um, so I'm going to need this graded thing, in order to make sense of the Proj construction, I needed a graded ring. So I'm, I'm going to need to quotient by a graded ideal to have some sensible graded structure on whatever I'm taking Proj of. So that's why that's in brackets. But uh, this is an if. So if I assume that I'm radical, then we'll get this projective k variety thing. But the converse is not true. Um, I'm not going to do it. But you can check. It's actually not that hard. But I want to prove a thing at the end. So. Uh, if you check this example, example to show Congress doesn't hold. Okay, so that's not a radical ideal. It is graded, but you can check that if you if you do this, you're still going to get a reduced quasi-projective case scheme. So, um, okay, let's prove this. I hope you're not all getting too bored. I'm trying to put humor in here, but there's only so much that I can do. There's so many definitions. I promise it'll be better. If you, if you stick with me till the end, there's a really sweet proof. So, um, yeah. Or I'm lying. I'm not sure. Okay. Let's prove this. Okay, so what do we need to check for A? I'm, I wrote it all the way over there. I'm very sorry about this. You're going to have to do some fancy camera work. Uh, what do I need to check, right? So, well, it's an affine k-scheme. We all agree, right? It's affine. It's a k-scheme. It's finite type, definitely, right? It's quite, it's, it's, there's, one, there's one in the cover. Um, I just need to check it's reduced. So basically what this will amount to is it'll say, okay, this is... Reduced if and only if this is radical. But that'll be enough. OK. I shouldn't have written it. This was poor board work. I'm sorry. Uh, OK, so let's pick a direction. Let's say, OK, let i be radical. I'm prob someone probably has done this already. Like, and it may have been me, because I think I did the reduced stuff. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> you get to see it for real now. Uh, so suppose I'm radical. I want to show that I'm reduced. I think I proved that spec A is reduced if and only if the ring A is reduced. Was it me? Yes. OK. Uh, so I just need to show that the ring is reduced. But this is just, this is just true, right? So if I take f to the n, sorry, that's a little small. I'm sorry. 
f to the n is 0 mod that ideal, right? Or f n is 0 in this, in this ring, then, then f to the n is in the ideal, but it's radical, so f is in the ideal. So in this ring, f is 0. So the ring is reduced, hence x is reduced as a scheme. Great. Uh, suppose x is reduced. <laughs> okay, I want to show that i has to be radical now. But I mean, it's the same thing, right? So I'm going to say, suppose f to the n is an i. That means that in my ring, f to the n is 0 again. The scheme is reduced if and only if the ring is reduced. There's no non-zero null potence. So we're good. OK. That was, I'm not sure if that was pointless or not, but you all saw it. So it's just true. Good. B. Uh, slightly harder. Um, just for my peace of mind, let's call this ring S, okay? And I want to show that proj S is a K variety. So we'll use this description that we have that I'll have to write down again. Um, ah, fine. I kept doing this in Nick's office, too. I would always drop the spec. OK, we have this description, right? So here's a finite affine cover, um, and it looks like this. So I want to check, OK, i is radical. Well, we just saw if i is radical, this ring is reduced. So that's reduced. If I localize, I'm going to stay reduced. I'm just going to keep putting parentheses. And if I take a degree 0 piece, that's just a subring. That's definitely reduced. There's no issue about like finally generate or anything like that. It's just that's just always true. So um, scheme is reduced. It's got to cover all the things reduced. Okay, good. So that's that. Okay, surely there's another definition that I have to give. Yeah, so maybe, maybe while I'm erasing. Um, apparently, we need this separatedness condition for, for varieties in general. I don't know. Is there anything you guys? I have no idea. Maybe I'm just, I'm just asking for filler. Is there any, is there any, like, any like, motivation, any like, enlightenment, maybe, that you could? I guess that takes more machinery. Like I guess that's 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 why we can't do it now. Yeah. Okay, that was. I guess I already knew that. I'm not sure why. Now it's on camera. Um, okay. So now begins. Well, sort of. Now begins kind of the wrap up of everything that was left in 5.3. So a few things to do. Uh, one of the things that we want to do. Um, I think for at some point in the future, it's not really clear when yet, but we want to have this notion of like a degree of a close point. So to motivate that, we're going to prove the following thing, uh, which will say that this is a sensible thing to do. So write this down. Oh no, I might miss my one definition for board. No. <laughs> All right.
So here's what we're going to show. Start with locally finite case scheme. Then a point in there is going to be closed if and only if the residue degree at that point is finite. So that's supposed to be kappa p. I'm going to try to do a fairly good job of keeping kappa, which will just look like a k, because I'm not that talented, and, uh, and the lowercase k, which I'm going to do kind of scripty. Uh, if and only if that degree is finite at a point. Uh, and the second thing we'll prove, which will be kind of nice, I guess, is that the closed points in such a scheme are going to be dense, which I think is my understanding is that that's pretty rare. That doesn't happen very often. Even in fairly nice schemes, I think that's just not usually true. But for these ones, I guess they're extra nice. So we'll find out. It's a locally finite type, do you think? Yeah, sorry. I guess that's what I did say, didn't I? Yeah, OK. Because finite is going to mean something different later. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's right. You all knew what I meant. Except, yeah. OK. <laughs> all right. Well, let's do this. Um, I can write, I know I'm locally finite type, so I can write x as a union of some spec bi's. All of these guys are finally generated k algebras. Okay. Um, which way do I want to go first? No, let's do that. So. Let's start with a close point. Okay, then it sits inside some spec bi. Well, I know what the stock, I, I'm going to try to compute this, this residue degree. I know that I can compute it just looking at this affine set. Um, and when I do that, I know what it looks like. This was done at one point or another. They look like localizations of the ring, right? Now, I'm just going to, from here until the end of the proof, make a local convention. When I'm talking about the point P, I'll just write P. When I think of it as a prime ideal sitting inside of BI, I'm going to use square brackets. So where, where I associate like that. That's going to be the notation that we use, just so that we're clear. Okay, Because I can't, I'm not talented enough to do lowercase p's and uppercase p's and frac p's and all these things. So that's my, yeah. OK. So we'll compute. What is this guy? Well, it's a local ring. It's a residue field. Everybody knows what this maximum ideal is, hopefully. Um, I'm going to put this as fact. I think that this came up. If you have an integral domain, this is just always true. The prime ideal. It's just always, it's always what you get. So this, I'm going to kind of just use this kind of everywhere from now on. Uh, pretty much this calculation that we just did. Yeah, I'm just going to use it a bunch. I think Dana did, you mentioned this at least. Yeah, surely. I can't keep track. Anyways, so if P is closed, we're really kind of tying together a lot of different things that we did at varying points in the past, I think. If P is closed, if P is closed, then this is maximal. Right? So, well, frac of BI mod P is a field. Well, it's always a field, I guess. But in fact, it's actually BI mod P because it's already a field. Fantastic. Uh, there's a statement of the Nostalgia stats. Which will give us what we want. Let me write this down. And it says the following. If you have, if you have a finitely generated algebra over a field that also happens to be a field, then it's necessarily a finite field extension. Um, I'm not sure if everybody knows it in that form, uh, but that's the form that we'll use. So in particular, because we started with a locally finite type K scheme, I got it right, nice. This is finally generated K algebra, so KP is a finally generated K algebra, and it's also a field, so it has to be a finite field extension. Uh, do I have a, I think I have a reference for this, actually. Some statement, here's on my next page. What one is it? So three point, yeah. 
So 3.2.5, I think this is given. Kappa B. Okay. That's fine. Okay, so that's one direction. Good. Now we need the other one. Which way do we do? I started with a close point. Okay. Suppose this is finite. Okay. I want to show that P is close. Okay. Well, again, let's just take X as this union of spec BIs. Then, okay, suppose B is in some spec BI. Okay. Um, Same calculation, and we'll get the following. Don't know that this is a field just yet. Okay. This lives inside here. Now, by hypothesis, by hypothesis, this is a finite field extension of K. Okay. So in particular, this, this is finite as a K module. How do we want to state that? K vector space, I guess, as K module. OK. There's an exercise. Unfortunately, I, I have to do this to you guys. There was an exercise that I've, it's been so long now, I don't know if we did it. But it says the following. If you have an integral domain, sorry, I keep walking in and out. If you have an integral domain, which is finite as a K module, then it's actually, it's actually a field. If you're an integral domain, if it's finite dimensional as a k vector space, finite, finite k module, then it's necessarily a field. Okay. So such things are fields. IEP is maximal. Okay. Um, so you convince yourself by, by some version of something that we did at one point. Um, if I take the closure of P living inside of spec BI, I get P. It's closed inside of BI. So that's pretty good. Um, but we've done this actually for every, every time P lives in any spec BI. This is always true. I always get this closure statement. So there's a more general way to do arguments like this that I think Deanna actually handed to me. Most of the stock was handed to me by Deanna. Thank you. Um, but there's a more general way to do this sort of thing. But uh, we can just do it. I want to compute now the closure, um, just the closure in x. And I can do it just like this. This is enough now. Well, I can intersect it with x. That's fine. point, there's some, there's some fact about point set topology and relative closure and things like this. But this is actually just the closure of P taken with respect to each spec bi. But we just saw every time I do this, I get P back. So P is actually closed in all of x. Okay. So if this is, this is not familiar to people, the notation I'm using, if you have B sitting inside of A sitting inside of x, I can think about the closure of B taken inside of A. And in fact, if I want to have a look at the closure of B taken inside of, oh, sorry, inside of A, that's actually A intersect this. So that's the fact that you're appealing to. That's just generically true. Um, kind of nice, easy way to do this. So, cool. We have part B still, yeah. How are we doing on time? Okay. Still doing okay. So what do I want to show? 
I want to show that all the closed points are dense. So what we'll do is we'll take an open set. And I want to show that there's a closed point in there, right? OK. Uh, well, what we'll do, take a basic open set that lives inside of, I want some kind of like coordinates to work with. So intersect it with some affine piece that intersects it non trivially, and just take some basic open set contained in there. Now I've got something to work with. If I find a close point in here, then we're still good, right? OK. Um, paper? Okay, we've done this sorts of thing before. I know what the section over the basic open set looks like. It looks like the localization, right? So, okay. How about this point? There's a maximal ideal of AF. Everything has units. Um, just let start with that point, okay? Then I can compute. Well, okay, fine. I can compute this guy. Same thing we just did, right? But now we use the same trick. The null stall says, is okay. We started with a locally finite type K scheme. Yes. Um, so this is a finitely generated K algebra that also happens to be a field, right? So it's a finite field extension. So by the same trick, kappa P over K is finite. And so by A, this point has to be closed, right? P is closed by A. Okay, so that's pretty cool. All the closed points are dense. I'll have like a breather. It's like, that was really fast. I still have time. I want to I get to that 5.4. Um, I have something here that says remarks. So there's a few variations on, on the null stall stats that I maybe I was not aware of before Deanna gave me these notes. So um, the first is the one that we keep using, which is kind of cool. Um, the second is actually, I, and I didn't, I, get, I mean, all these statements, I guess, are equivalent. So in some sense, I did know them but I didn't know them in this way, right? So uh, the other one that I don't think we used, but it's kind of cool, is uh, if you have a field, say, I'm just going to just doodle over here, I guess. If you have field K and you look at polynomial ring, this is kind of just restating it, but um, if you look at all of the maximal ideals, they have residue field finite extensions of K. That's another way of stating what I just said. So that's kind of cool. Breaks up the monotony of all these definitions, but um, another definition. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, with this in mind as motivation, actually, it took quite a few boards. Okay. Suppose I have one of these schemes, so locally finite type. Oh. Suppose I have a close point. Well, we're going to set the degree of P. It's going to be just the index. We just showed that this is finite. So this is a, a normal kind of thing to look at. Um, I'm not going to use this for the rest of this talk, but I think I think that this is the last piece of notation or terminology that I'm going to have to set in this talk. So now, now we're done with all of that. Um, but in case that this comes up in the future, that's what we have. So maybe some examples. Suppose I have the affine line. OK. 
kt. Right. What do closed points look like? Well, they look like irreducible polynomials. Never know how to write these p of t brackets. I guess it's the ideal, right? No. OK, we're going to do this. OK. I have no idea. All right. And <laughs> we've got one of these points. Um, what's the degree of this point p? Same thing we always do. Sorry, I should really say this is irreducible. Right, those are my close points. So if I look at this index, surely we know this is the degree of P of P. I'm sure everybody's done this at one point. First of all, the fraction field is kt over pt. But, uh, yeah. OK. Um, if k is algebraically closed, what's going to happen? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Should always be one, right? What are the maximal ideals of kt? Well, they're t minus a, right? They will just put if k is. Algebraically closed. All right, the maximal ideals, or the, the, the close points, all look like just the ideal generated by t minus a. Right? So I'm going to get, if I follow along this calculation, I'm just going to get this ah, 1. Right, kt over t minus a over k, which is 1. So pretty cool. Those are all of our examples. What's that? Yes. Yes, cap of p is 1, always, yeah. Four. I'll make, OK, this will, I can make this syntactically make sense. <laughs> I can do this. Then all close points have to be 1. OK, done. OK, five minutes left. Um, I think I can do what I wanted to do. I know, I'm sorry that was a little fast. Uh, so section 5.4, uh, I think we'll talk about um, like normality of schemes and all of some more scheme properties, because we haven't had enough. Um, <laughs> so uh, was that a little dry? That sounded a little dry to me. Um, I guess normality is good. Um, one of the things that we will show implies normality is something called factoriality. So it comes up a little later in the section, so I apologize to whoever's going next, because I'm just going to steal some thunder. But I have a cool proof, and I want to show it, so too bad. I'm going to make a definition of factoriality, and I'm going to do a thing where I show that if, if a ring has a property, then spec of the ring has a property. And I'm going to do it in a cool way. So this is the definition. OK, um, scheme x. If all stocks x are U of T's. So we saw integral domains, we saw integral schemes, we saw reduced schemes. We work our way up this ladder. Um, we get to U of T's. So what happens at U of T level? Um, but I'm just going to ask the stocks P U of T's. I'm not going to say that the sections are. Um, this is all we got. So this is also an interesting fact just on its own. And that's why I wanted to do this. So what letter is this? No idea. E? Okay, E. So also, there's a lot of exercises in this section that are just kind of uh, more or less basic commutative algebra facts. So uh, I don't think they're very hard. I wasn't going to prove them if I got to them, but I didn't get to them. So. I guess whoever goes next can decide what they want to do. Uh, anyways, this is a cool fact. I'll write it down. So localizations of U of T's are U of T's. Didn't know that. Maybe you guys did, but I have never seen this before. 
um, as long as you don't do something stupid like non-zero, like non-zero localizations, regular ones. Um, yeah, kind of an interesting fact. It seems like it would be a real pain to prove this directly. I didn't try. Maybe it's not that bad, but I think that I think that if you wanted to say, okay, I want to write everything as products and stuff, I think it becomes kind of a gong show. So I have a side. I have a way to sidestep this, and it's going to rely on a cool theorem, which I also didn't know. Um, and it is not that hard to prove. So it's due to Kaplansky, uh, and it goes like this. It completely characterizes UFTs. But an integral domain is U of D if and only if every time you have a non-zero prime, it contains a non-zero principal prime ideal. And one direction of this you can kind of see how to do, right? So if I take a prime ideal in U of D and I take something that's not zero, I can factor it. I can pull one of the elements out, and now I can get a principal that lives inside of it. The other direction is kind of hard, um, but it's not like it's it's about half a page. You just kind of have to do it. There's kind of some like weird induction that you have to do, but uh, it's not that difficult. But in any case. Um, I claim that if we, we're going to use this to do 5.4e, but if we have this, then we're good to go in this. Oh, never mind, never mind. Sorry. I got ahead of myself. All right. Let's prove 5.4e. I'm losing my mind. So I want to show that if I localize UFD, I get UFD. So we'll start with UFD. S multiplicatively closed. I want to show that S inverse A is U of D. So we'll take a prime in S inverse A. Remember some commutative algebra. They all look like there's a, there's a bijection between the primes of S inverse A and all the primes of A that miss S. Right? The bijection is given between you should take a prime in A and you should just extend it. Right? So if I take a prime in S inverse A, I can write it as just the extension of something. So P to the E be some prime. I want to show, I'm going to use this characterization in S inverse A. I want to come up with a principal one that lives inside of here. Well, if I use Kaplansky's theorem for A, we know there exists some principal ideal that's such that lives in here. Okay, in A. But now we're good, right? So if I extend up, First of all, they're both non-zero, right? Because Q misses S, because P misses S, and they stay prime. So we're good. By Kaplansky's theorem applied S inverse A. Like EFT. That's pretty cool. I ran into Nick's office and I was like, you have to see this. But the point of this, why do, why do I care, right? Like this is corollary. A is UFD. Spec A is factorial. Right. What are the stocks of spec A? They're localizations. That's it. So. I'm not going to write a proof of that, but that's it. That gives it to you. So, I'm sorry I went a little bit over one minute, but uh, I kind of wanted to show that to you. So, that's all I have. Cool. Thanks, guys.